And welcome back to Contemporary Black Voices, where our topic today deals with California possibly becoming the first state to offer undocumented migrants housing assistance. So, and, and I have today also on my, on my, on my right, I have Caleb Alexander, and to my left, I have Ella Winston, as you know, they're co-hosting today with me. So I wanna read some stuff off before we um, close off this segment. Black, indig black indigenous and people of color are overrepresented among homeless populations. Individuals who identify as black account for 39% of people experience, experiencing homelessness, but represent only 12% of the U.S. population. Then, in a, households that are extremely low on income renters are more likely to be black, indigenous, and people of color. What's more, women of color, specifically those who are low income, are faced with higher rates of eviction and are particularly cost burden. Because of systemic racism and its residual effects in redlining, segregation, incarceration, housing discrimination, and denied economic, economic opportunities, black folks in particular have and will continue to face significant barriers, barriers as accessing safe, quality, and affordable housing if solutions to homelessness and housing instability are not approached using a racial equity lens. So it kind of goes back to the previous point I made, these gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. Do we have a situation there? Will we have a situation there? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you see it and here. Uh, when people go to apply for different programs or different aid, different assistance, there's always gatekeepers. There's always, it, it, again, it's systemic, you know what I mean? And, and it's always been systemic. When, when black folks went to go uh, to apply for uh, loans back in the day for housing, for mm -hmm. business, the gatekeepers did not. When they, when they needed assistance uh, through the, the Veterans Administration or the, the Farm, Farm Bureau, uh, so they were denied from uh, agricultural loans, you know what I mean? And so it, it, they're, they're always gatekeepers and they're always uh, uh, mechanisms that they use to deny uh, black folks. Okay. And that's definitely still going on. Mm -hmm. Right. So with that in mind, so Miss Winston, give us some of your final thoughts about the topic. My final thoughts are, again, what are the qualifications we must have to be able to get these benefits? And why can't we, for some reason, surpass their qualifications? That's my takeaway. When are we gonna have the chance to qualify for homes, for home loans, for colleges outside of black colleges? When are we gonna have that chance? My takeaway, again, I'm very disappointed. This is a touchy subject and my children have to grow up in this. How can I make that change? Okay. Kayla, what are your final thoughts? So, no, I mean, a couple of things. One, I, I, I worked at a Sober Recovery Center, and at one time we wanted to expand the program to have a, a residential facility for veterans. Veterans cannot get the help they need because if, if veterans uh, go into a uh, residential rehab, they get charged by the government for misappropriation of government funds because they, they're they using uh, the government funds, their the VHX, veterans. right, the mm -hmm. veterans. They're using their VHX to use, to. it's evidence that they're using their tr uh, VA benefits or, or, or checks from the government for drug use. So they get charged. They can lose their veterans benefits. So if you ask what can the government do to change that because of veteran housing, veteran homelessness, they can change that statute. That's one allow the veterans to get the help that they need in rehab so that they can, uh, they can participate in programs that will get them uh, sober and get them uh, uh, back into the economy, make them productive citizens again, and get them off the streets. So that's one thing the government can do. The other thing that I want to touch on with this program, uh, you know, like my sister was saying earlier, you know what I mean, as far as uh, the numbers. 
And so I know I, I, I've said this a few times, but the numbers are this. Uh, every other uh, every other population is, is on a decline. Mm -hmm. U.S. Uh, white population, European population, China's population is declining dramatically. Japan. Every Japan. India's population is going to peak within the next 14 years, and then it's going to start a sharp decline. The only population that is rising rapidly are black folks. And so within the next 75 years, black folks will make up 70, uh, uh, 50 percent of this world's population, 50 percent of the world's population. So imagine if 50 percent of the world's population were unified and spoke with one voice. That's power. So that's my other thing that I want to say about that. But, uh, yeah, if you want to know what the government can do, people keep saying, well, what, what's, what's a black agenda? What's a black agenda? What's a black agenda? So now this might be an example of what a black agenda could be. You know what I mean? Uh, the stuff that the feds can do as far as housing programs, the stuff that the feds could do as far as uh, making sure that there's equity in agricultural loans, making sure there's equity in banking and finance and, 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 and those kind of opportunities. Uh, so there are, th there are things that the federal government can do since people keep asking what's a black agenda. And those are the foundations of a black agenda. You know what I mean? There's equal access to these funds, these federal funds, these programs. Uh, they can transform uh, education in this country. And I know I've said this a, no a number of times, but there needs to be um, a uh, a solid grant for HBCUs, uh, just a solid endowment that all the HBU HBCUs can yeah. draw upon. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's that's another thing that the federal government can do, and that's a powerful black agenda: education for black folks. So it sounds it's like our it sounds like our congressional black caucus need to just get up and do something, you know, <laughs> get up and do something. I just want to be funny here. You, so <laughs> if in today's time we can identify as whatever we can identify at this point, maybe we should identify ourselves as protons on our, our checklist. And maybe, that, maybe that'll change something. You know, we can identify as other than what we are and get rights. Maybe that's what we should do uh, at this point. That sounds desperate. Uh, it, <laughs> this is how desperate they are. So it's ugly. Well, but before we sign off, I want to thank our producers, Linnell Taylor and Carl Booker, who help us put this show together. Without them, we couldn't do this. And we also want to thank our viewing audience. We appreciate your comments, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But we do appreciate it because that means you're listening to us. And with that being said, the overall question was, when is enough enough? That's something that we have to all start this conversation. And we hope that you have a great weekend. And as we say, this is Contemporary Black Voices, where we're telling our story our way.